All right, guys, thanks so much for listening to another episode of the CX Chronicles podcast. I'm your host, Adrian Brady Chisana. Super excited. We have a, a special guest today joining us, guys. Uh, Slavi Ravi, as many of you know, welcome to the show, my friend. Also, also, also known as Robert Hall. Welcome to CXE, my friend. How are you today? I'm excellent. Thank you for having me, man. Excited to be here. Hundred percent, brother. So, guys, I was I was pumped to to uh, to get Robbie on the show today. I think as him and I were just joking around before we jumped into today's uh, episode for all of you guys. This is a different type of show, man. Normally, every week we're having different types of startup founders, startup executives, different types of business leaders coming on the show, and they're rapping about how they're building their software company, or they're rapping about how they're building their digital product company, or whatever that, whatever cool thing that they're building. Robbie's got a totally different game that he's here to pitch today that he's going to talk with us about. And then selfishly as a fan of his work and just as a fan of some of the content and some of the incredible things he's done with Generation Cool, he's going to give us a totally different spin on how we could think about not only our customer experiences, building a super cool, super dope thing with our business, but like thinking about what he had to go through to, 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 to build, build his world, build his business, build Generation Cool, uh, build the show, man. Like there's a bunch of things that we're going to, to, to jump into today. So I'm super excited to get started. All right. Why don't you kick us off, brother? Why don't you start off? Just set the stage, man. Give us a sense for how the hell did you get into this wild world? How'd you get into this whole world of uh, of building the business you built and doing the types of work and the doing the type of content that you built out today? Man, I think I got into it uh, in a few ways, but first and foremost, as a collector of all this type of stuff and uh, as sort of a uh, uh, actual true hobby right so for me uh i started getting it you know older and i started feeling sort of nostalgic and longing for you know things of the past like the toys i had when i was a kid the air jordans i couldn't afford when i was a kid and so on and so forth so i got into collecting you know and i got into uh going to flea markets and swap meets and yard sales and trying to find some of this stuff that was sort of uh the treasure hunt you know aspect for me early on and then ebay came along and that was obviously like a huge 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 moment in reselling hobbying collecting all this like sort of marketplace right where you could yeah. realize that there was thousands and millions of other people out there that were finding stuff that i like or that wanted to buy stuff that I find and, yep. As, yep. you know, that, that had all this stuff that I've always been looking for or that had all this great stuff I never even knew existed. So a marketplace, right? Yep. Uh, and then um, I guess around in a roundabout way, my hobby and my passion always found a way into like whatever I was doing, whether I was a teacher or working with kids in a group home or a therapist for kids, you know, I was always kind of working with fashion and design and, and sneakers and collecting and, you know, um, and over the course of, you know, probably about 15 years, I just, uh, a, a, a hobby of mine slowly, but surely, became a realization because that, I, that that was what I really, really wanted to do. So um, combine all my people skills from working in all these jobs and all the schooling and, and go, three art degrees of, you know, just learning yeah. uh, you know, the, not only business, but how to talk in front of people and email properly and all the things I learned from college mixed out with real life people skills from working with people for 20 years. And uh, it was really easy to sort of jump right into a, uh, my dream business, which was reselling 80s and 90s, you know, vintage, reselling the stuff that I had when I was a kid, the stuff I grew up with, the stuff that many people find, you know, classic and iconic out there in the marketplace uh, when it comes to retail and, and reselling, you know. Um, so we, we sell vintage, you know. Uh, I sell everything from sneakers to toys to collectibles to T-shirts to hats, to sunglasses, to jewelry, uh, the, it, 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 iconic stuff that everyday names, everyday brands that everybody knows that are all-time classics. I love it, brother. I, I think number one, I think I, I, I got to imagine a number of reasons why people um, are fans of not only your work and not only the uh, fans of the, of the business you built, but dude, you just nailed it, brother. I think when I first saw um, when I first saw Slobby's World and I saw some of the content that you were doing, my immediate draw, my immediate hook, well, number one, you're, 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 you're your character, so you're fun and you're engaging, but it's the first part you said, brother, it's like you immediately brought me back to my childhood, man. Some of the, some of the different things that you guys were curating and some of the things that you had in your shop, 
it immediately brought you back to this place of where, whether it was like Ninja Turtles or video games or like some of the dope hats that like you guys have on your rack that literally we used to have as kids, like me and my brother, like I remember it stuff. It brought it all back. It's a totally yeah. different type of experience that you're curating, man. It's a not, it's not your traditional off the shelf product or, 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 or willy or where you're curating and giving your customers an experience, whether it's bringing them back or whether it's producing and furnishing some of these goods. So let's just call it what it is, Rob. It's hard to find this stuff, right? Man, part of part of the art of your craft is like knowing where to find this stuff, buy it a little yeah. bit low, sell it a little, lot, a little bit high for people that love that stuff and want to pay a premium for it. Yeah, and, and that was, you know, sort of, I guess what you are paying for in the vintage world or, you know, in this in this sort of resale fashion world is the convenience, right? Big time. So, you know, yes, you can have 10 different computers and bots and wake up at five in the morning and have X amount of dollars in your bank account to buy all these sneaker drops, but you could also just pay extra and have, pay the convenience fee and totally get the convenience fee. without all the drama. So <laughs> I think that sneaker reselling isn't too much different than vintage in a lot of ways, you know, um, maybe a little bit more uh, better for the planet, you know, in a lot of ways than, than the, like sneaker world or the video game world, or, you know, some of these other, you know, reselling arenas. Um, but, you know, making sure that you have what people need is important. But in my case, you know, it was almost more like making sure that I had the stuff that I wanted to represent and that I, and that I find special and then being able to create a, um, environment and then create a marketplace where people trust my eye and yeah. are trusting my yeah. curation skills a lot like a, an art curator which is what i went to school to be um and i think that's sort of where i maybe flipped everything on its head and it wasn't so much about like oh you know can you get this can you get that it was more like you know here's the stuff that i think is dope and you know you know making sure that everybody understands why it's important why it's cool and why it's worth so much you know and doing the educational part you know it's the education piece man it's like that's the big part of it is like some of the stuff that that, that you and your team actually knows about some of the products or knows about some of the goods that you guys are are selling that's a huge part of it Robbie I think like having that education having that background I'd argue telling the story, like, right. Whatever we're all selling, right. We all got different businesses. We all got different things that we're trying to trying to get out there into the world, but big, huge part of selling guys, it's being able to tell that damn story. It's being able to tell somebody why it's so cool, why it's got a certain value, why I had a special place in a, in a special time and getting sure. people to like, understand what that story is. That's part of, that's a major part of any buying process. It's a ma major part of any customer experience is giving people a view or like a, like a, like a vision into why this thing is important and why they need to spend some money on it and bring it into their own lives. Right. I think that's huge, man. I think that's huge. Sure. Absolutely. Probably I'd love to, I'd love to dive in. I know. So this is fun. I know it's a different one guys, but we're always talking about the four CX pillars on our show, right? We're talking about team. We're talking about tools. We're talking about process and we're talking about feedback. I want to get into the, I want to, I want to get into the Robbie's world version of those four CX pillars. So let's start with the first pillar team, man. I'd love to hear as you've been building your business, as you've been building uh, generation cool. And as you built, as you built your content side of the business, Love for you to just take a couple minutes to talk about team, man. How, how have you thought about leveraging some of the people in your life and some of the some of the people around you to even be able to get this thing off the ground and to be able to get it to where you are today? Yeah, I, I came from a, a place of team, you know, and professionally in in, in a lot of ways. Um, and, but then I came into this thinking a lot, um, you, you know, a lot more like an individual artist right also so i think that i've been more successful as i've gone back to team so for instance uh, i worked in group homes and we worked with teenagers and you know teenage boys who had nowhere else to go and you know maybe wards of the state you know such and such yeah, yeah. temporarily you know waiting to go to another state and but uh, a lot of times um a pretty, a, a, a pretty, you know, sort of delicate environment, you know, let's call it. And then, you know, but also you have a big team on a situation like that. Cause you know, you're not, you, you, while you are the parent for that 10, 12 hours at a time, you, you can't be there 24 seven. And, you know, so we had teams, right. And so yeah. I really, I, I became the program manager. So I became the, the, the supervisor of a group home. And that's when I started really understanding uh, the importance of a team and the importance of, different people who were able to 
step into different roles and the, but also as this as the program manager making sure the right person was the overnight staff right yep. so making sure that the you know the, the am staff is, is a morning person who's good you know and, and i started totally. realizing that there were some people who were built for some roles you know just like uh, you know maybe on a football team Big time. Uh, you know or a basketball very similar team. sports yeah, so we, we I, I really learned, and even just by leveling up within the system of the company I was in, a lot of things we did was study team and study group dynamic and stuff like that. So fast forward to, you know, of course, going through college, you know, I was always good. You know, you know people say they dreaded team assignments and whatever. I've always worked in a team, so it was really easy for me to work in group atmospheres, you know, in, in college. It was easy for me to work with a team of professors and come up with my goals as an artist or, you know, what, what have you, right? So when I started this, we had a small team, and it was just me and my business partner, JR. Yeah. And uh, I think my vision was so strong and my vision was so specific and my vision was so, uh, you know, sort of um, large, right? And, and sort of larger than life that um, by nature, he kind of early on really figured out where his place was on the team, right? So it was, it, it became obvious that if the news comes and wants to talk to us, they usually wanted to talk to me. Uh, it became, you know, obvious that like a lot of the, um, you know, a lot of the buying for, you know, and the knowledge of, of, of value and buy, sell and trade part was going to fall on me, you yeah. know, because he was really good at, uh, you know, um, other things, you know, and he, he was definitely the more uh, mathematical and sort of the accountant, you yeah. know, of, yeah. of the firm. And, and again, when there's only two people, <laughs> when there's only two people, you know, he almost had to do that out of necessity, just like I almost had to, you know, you know, uh, do a lot of things myself out of necessity, but we didn't really talk about it, you know, <laughs> it just yeah, yeah, happened. Yeah. yeah, I did a lot of the hiring and the firing and the people stuff in it because I had been a supervisor i had done all this stuff before um so we had to kind of find our roles and then as we as we got on we realized that we needed to add people to our team uh accountants um you know we had we brought in def uh, a business partner i think two or three years in we brought yep. in a third business partner who who kind of filled a void which was like supply and demand so you know we brought in zach and zach was able to go and find a lot of the stuff, spend a lot of his time on finding things and traveling and bringing stuff back and, you know, performing at a level that I couldn't perform when it came to bringing in merchandise. Right. Also. Yep, yep. So all of a sudden there was the three of us with our three roles. And then um, just like with any team or any situation or any business, everything, things changed and things changed and things changed. And I, you know, I realized you know, sort of as, I guess, the CEO of this company, that the biggest secret all along was that I needed a, a team. Yeah, and that yeah. mm -hmm. the more the merrier, you know? Yeah. And, yeah. and so now my graphic designer, he feels like he put, kind of works here, you know? My my accountant kind of works here. Yeah. You know, he, yeah, yeah, he, yeah. he's people who are part of my team that I used to think of as, like, annoying extra people that I had to talk to <laughs> on a different basis. You know, yeah. at the beginning, because I wasn't looking at it the right way. And then when I realized that these people like are part of our team and that we all go together, you know, that I realized that, um, I mean, my fix it guy, you know, my, my fix it guy is part of our team. My electrician is part of my, the light in my office was out when I came in this morning. I just, before I forgot, I just texted the electric guy, but these are <laughs> things that were, were uh, kind of, you know, I was so aware of the importance of team, but then I, I had this approach where I was like, you got this. This is all me. I'm going to save totally. money and do this. Yeah, and yeah, I realized yeah. that I was probably wrong. And those first few years were so stressful around here for a reason, because I just didn't know what I was you know, doing. And, and I didn't realize that all my experience in business before having to do with forming teams was what I was missing. So, you know, my screen printer, um, you, you name it, you know, yep, yep. Uh, but now we have our team here and I have somebody who does the Instagram, somebody else who does the website, you know, another guy who's just the manager of my sneaker store. And that's all he knows is the sneaker business, you know? So um, I've never felt more comfortable beginning. It's probably because I finally uh, sat back and realized that I had a team that yeah. could handle things and that yeah. I didn't need to constantly like Lord over everybody, you know? 
Dude, I, I love it. I think so. A couple of things, man. Number one, you just you just nailed this whole aspect that our listeners have got to be thinking about, which almost every successful business owner um, or business executive gets to in a certain place in his or her career. And that's the power of delegation, man, because you just nailed it, Robbie. The minute that you start delegating this stuff and you realize, yeah, it's not about it's not about pride. It's not about doing everything perfect. It's not about always wanting to own that stuff. I get it. Many of us entrepreneurs, that's that's how we start. But you've only got 24 hours a day, right? You only got 24 hours in a day as a human. The minute you start pulling the JRs and the Zacks and the screen printers and the social manager into the game, you start compounding that stuff. Your ability to grow your business, your ability to find more customers, your ability to get your get your name out there, get your brand out there. The, the sourcing part, Robbie, when you talked about um, adding your teammate who start helped with supply and demand and the economics of Generation Cool and the economics of like, Yo, for Robbie to make a bunch of money on a bunch of cool things, somebody's got to go find a bunch of pieces of history, right? That are out there, whether it's caps, whether it's jerseys, whether it's whether it's memorabilia, like super cool things that are like just hidden out there. That takes a team, man. That's a village, right? That's not just as as, as great as one artist is, as great as one business founder is, one business entrepreneur. Man, anybody can use some help and anybody can use some extra sets of hands. One last thing you just mentioned is that I can't like, I, I think is so spot on. And so many people got to remember this is like, once you start putting a bunch of smart brains together and a bunch of s- smart minds together, there's another compound interest that happens right there. You get, it's like being in a band, man, or being in, in a right. group. Something yes. happens where like, there's a compounded interest that happens where you start to, your powers get more powerful, right? For lack of a better way of saying it. Like, yeah. yeah. And, and you know, it's, emo- it's sort of like emotional support at the same time. So I can ask Zach, you know, you don't feel like, ah, you know, in life sometimes as a grown up, you're like, you know, you have your rent and your mortgage or whatever. You have those things on the back of your head. And then as a business owner, it's like another rent and another insurance payment. But when you have somebody who sort of like, you know, can do that part. It can take yep. something off. And then they, but you might even just someone to talk to, you know, oh God, the electric bill's gone up like crazy, you know, huh? But at least you have, you have like sort of this emotional support of, of somebody who's, you know, in this, you know, with you. And I think you're exactly right. Um, you know, you, I started realizing that I, I didn't always, even though I, you know, have so much confidence in myself and my decisions and my ideas. I didn't always have everything, you know, figured out in the sense that somebody else just might look at something a different way or if anything, these other people's brains are thinking of a better way to do something. And and a lot of times a cheaper way to do something that I wouldn't have thought of. Right. So my screen printers, you know, now, now all of a sudden my, my graphic designer, he knows now that he that I don't like dealing with the stuff. So he just emails my screen printer straight away. And he's like, he does, there's not that we don't need a text between me and them. And you know, he's 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 by getting so comfortable with him and building a relationship with him, he started doing more duties that I don't necessarily pay him for. Yeah, yeah. Because he's realizing his role and he's realizing how helpful and he's realizing uh his kind of sort of cog in the machine, you know, or his his piece in the machine. So um stuff that you know stuff that you just can't uh you know st- dynamics that, that stuff that will take some pressure off of you when it's time to make a decision or make things go faster or and and and, and frankly the more of these relationships you have the more money you probably end up saving because you know i send my graphic designer a bunch of business and when it's time for him to do something for me he usually probably is charging me less because I'm like the, his, his, you know, I've been working with him for five years and I, you know, I'm not the Johnny come lately asking for something rush, yep, you know, yep. I mean, I have a relationship. So I think you're exactly right. Be just being able to hear and, and, and use other people's input. It, and it really does help a lot. It's you, no matter how much you have it figured out. Um, I think probably my biggest mistake early on was just constantly assuming that I, I, my, that whatever was in my head was the best way to do something, but not, and not listening to, even if it's not business partners, you got to listen to your, to your employees, you know, the, the mailman might have a suggestion <laughs> on the box you can use. You never know. The more that you, you build know. relationships and just listen, it, it really yep. helps a lot. And, and then to take the pressure off yourself, teammates, you know, and business partners really help a lot. And, and it, and I would never, ever, I would never be, I would never even want to do this by myself. I dude, it, entrepreneurialism and, 
being a business owner, being a business leader, it's a lonely place, man. A, a lot of people, it's funny when you're growing up, your kid, you're, you're younger, whatever, you always have this aspiration. You want to, you want to be the business owner. You want to be the boss. You want to be the CEO. You want to be the, the leader, right? It's a, it's a hard, lonely place, man. It's not an easy place to come by. So the, 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 the more smart, um, uh, loyal, uh, dedicated individuals that you can surround yourself with, the better. Robbie, I'd love to jump into the second CX pillar of tools, brother. Talk about some of the tools that as you and JR built the business out, and especially as you started to get some traction going and, and things really started popping, not only with customers, but just like attention, you know, money, you hear people talk about this all the time. Money typically follows attention, right? You got to get people's attention before you can figure out how to do business with them or how to become friends with them or how to kind of make it, make it all happen. But what about tools, man? I'd love to hear in your trade, you got a specific niche business. What type of tools did you guys have to leverage? Or what type of technology did you have to leverage? You mentioned eBay earlier, but what, what was that like? What was that like to kind of build out that toolkit that let you guys build the business, grow the team and, 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 and become a super, super well-known part of this whole, this whole uh, space that you're dominating right now? Yeah, I think the most important tool for us was social media. Um, and that was what was able to sort of give me the opportunity to sort of become a, a face and a name and a person and a voice and a personality that you could affiliate with the business. Right. Yeah, yep, yep. So all of a sudden I was larger than the business, you know, I was larger than life because I was out there, you know, uh, um, I'm on my Instagram wearing crazy outfits out in the shop with all this cash in my hands or in the shop doing, you know, playing a prank on somebody or whatever. And, 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 and I was able to use sort of my own, um, experience and sort of um pizzazz and panache as a performance <laughs> artist almost yeah, yeah to, to to sell the business you know not 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 too much different than um these great these great like terrible local tv ads where you know like the car dealership guy dresses up you know we have a guy here tucson appliance company and the guy's dre like painted himself green like incredible hulk and, like pretends to crush you know like refrigerator <laughs> You know yeah. what I mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really yeah. bad, but it's really good, and I know who he is. You know, and it makes. Me, Ravi in Buffalo, know? we had we had Billy Fisella for years, going huge. He was always screaming huge about huge deals for for his car yeah. sales. Dude's one of the. He was one of the biggest car salesmen in America for decades running. His whole bit was huge, just getting people to remember like yeah. huge and thinking about him as their car salesman. Yeah, exactly. And, and and it doesn't always work. Of course, there's movies about that too. People just trying too hard, you know, the Mike, you know, the Michael Scott's of the world who you really aren't <laughs> the face of the franchise, you know, yeah, right. and you were meant to be. So you, you know, that's part of like, sort of, you know, if I, if I wasn't good at that kind of stuff, or if I wasn't, you know, sort of feeling that, you know, sort of performance, you know, based, uh, um, you know, tool then i would have tried to think of some other tools and see what what what, what really suits me you know it, am i more suited to writing you know or am i more suited to um music you know or you know like, let's say i was more of a musical business owner and less of an actor or performer or whatever you know yeah 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 that I would, I would rap, you know, make a rap about my store or something. So uh, I did what was natural to me, which was to like, you know, be a ham and take pictures. And um, more than anything, I think I was just true to the product that we were selling in the store. Really, was I was reflecting the store. The store was also reflecting my personality and my style. So it was really easy for people to, to affiliate with me. And of course, social media is, in general just grew, you know, and really became... Um, a really great free tool, right? And yeah. and I don't even think our website would have ever made this many sales if it wasn't for social media, you know, even before the show or whatever. So um, being being prepared to, uh, you know, I, I think that I knew all along that this was like kind of part of the uh, process was for me to put myself out there as like, you know, the guy, you know, when it comes yeah. to dinner. And, and when I say that, I mean like, the guy who, um, the guy who can really be the spokesman and tell you about my product. You know, the Billy, uh, what's the guy from Home Shopping? Now? You know, uh, oh, yeah, yeah, right, right. Uh, and you know, I, I, you know, I'm sort of like, you know, the guy when it comes to like my store. And then I was able to like start speaking on behalf of sort of vintage and reselling in general as one of the guys, you know, uh, one of the big voices in the vintage, you know, kind of world after that. Right. So I developed this tool where I was 
you know, vocal in person and in social media. And I developed, um, you know, a, a personality that was easy for people to like get to know through pictures and videos. Right. Yep. So uh, another tool, you know, would have been for us that I think the second most important one, which kind of goes with sort of people skills and getting out there, but would be, um, for me, traveling really helped and being able to show up to things like events and show up to, um, you know, cultural happenings that were were people that were sort of of my same ilk or maybe even people who I looked up to or I sure. aspired to. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Somebody, I started noticing that everyone was at Art Basel, you know, every yep. year. And I'm like, wow, what the heck's going on out there? Obviously, I love art and I have a background in art. But, uh, you know, I didn't have a business interest or, a, you know, a reason to, like, get, you know, let's say um, monetize Art Basel, right? Yeah, yeah. Yep. And, and so I started realizing, oh, you know, that we could do, you know, pop-ups in other cities when a big event's going on. I've gone out to Super Bowl, Art Basel, you know, you name it. I've done it. And and so to be able to combine business and pleasure, but make sure that it's a way to expand your brand, that was another tool I used early on. So I would say. It's an awesome one, brother. It's an awesome social- one. Yeah, social media and traveling really helped me enable me to be able to do some of the bigger things I was able to do, you know, with myself and the business. I love it, Ravi. I love it. Ravi, I want to jump into the third pillar of process. And you already started to bring us there, brother. But like a couple, couple ideas that I just heard you say that I want to hit on immediately. Number one, it's this idea of like, you can tell that over time, you guys figured out how to hone that craft hone that skill, get that brand out there. You as a, as an artist and as a curator also probably had to figure out over time how to really kind of, again, tell that story, get people's attention, figure out how to get them interested in some of the things that you already knew were popping. You already knew that they were going to, um, you know, bring a line full of people. You just mm. needed to tell a story or get the attention to a certain place. I'd love to just kind of hear, you know, hear you talk about the show a little bit on Netflix. And that had to have been a part of that process, man, because I know, you know, for, for, for me, it's where I became a fan. It's where, where, I, where I started to learn about your craft. It's where I learned about some of the things that you guys were doing out there to just find this like incredible stuff, man, from our childhood, things that are like going to forever be important to people in our age bracket. Right. And then on top of it, you made a market for it. Not only a marketplace, but you made this market where, dude, some of the stuff that you guys sell in the shop and some of the things that you're selling out there in the world, man, it's incredible the value of this stuff. Like what people are willing to pay for a certain pair of sneakers or a certain type of hat or a certain type of jersey that's in a per, you know that perfect type of shape but i'd love to hear you kind of talk about like the process for when you were able to actually bring some of the amazing work that you and the team were doing and get it put on a big huge stage like netflix number one but then i'd love to kind of hear what that process in itself was like it was it wildly different than when you and jr were running the shop did it bring a whole new set of complexities what did that kind of look like for you guys rep yeah, well, you know, I think that I had sort of a uh, a different um, sort of road, right? So I, we didn't have a, a road where we like, quote unquote, built, you know, the brand or built our personalities as much as we were kind of uh, um, discovered, you know, <laughs> you know, more like <laughs> yeah, man. A, a shopping mall and just happened. The guy just really liked the way he looked and the way he talked, you know, yep. that's kind of happened. So in a way, my whole life and, and especially my professional life was sort of preparing me to be able to talk, you know, and, and be charismatic and be informational and be um, articulate about, you know, this about stuff that I was passionate about. And I think that over the first few years, um, I was one of these people that was really willing to kind of talk about the stuff and, and if anything, share information that I didn't necessarily have to share. Right. Yep. So, yep. I was like, yeah, that's a, you know, someone messaged me and I say, oh, that's this type of jersey. They're really rare. They're worth a lot instead of trying to buy it off them and, you know, make the money myself. So I think that my willingness to share information at, toward the beginning of, of the like sort of vintage movement yep. helped me hone a skill where I was really good at talking about the stuff, really good at, um, you, you know, really good at um, executing a sale, right? So yep. I, I was so good at executing a sale and sort of being a spokesman for all this product that when Hollywood or, you know, whatever came <laughs> calling, I was ready and I didn't yeah. need a lot of coaching, you know, and I didn't need them to be like, well, here's how TV works. Or, you know, I would, I, 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 I was TV ready, you know? Yep. So I don't know how much of that was, you know, um, 
you know, sort of like prepared or, you know, uh, planned or, you know, or how much of it was really just organic. But I think that, you know, by us traveling and by us, you know, getting out there, meeting all these people and getting people's interest, we were kind of ready when when the big time came. Now, again, the, the, I think a lot of people would say, you know, start a YouTube, build a following, get better. We didn't do it. You know, my, my approach was... <laughs> Um, we didn't, I, I, I like, I hate to say this, but I, I, you know, I don't usually tell people that, uh, I would consider myself a grinder or a hard worker per se, as much as a, um, somebody who's really good at, at, at just using my brain, you know, to do a lot of the work and, yep. and, and figuring out the right places to insert myself or the right situations to insert myself in and, 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 and um, being ready for when those moments come, you know, and, I think for us, we could have started a YouTube channel that was funny about me and JR and picking and all that, but um, we were lucky enough that we were like this in real life, you know, and we didn't need to um, sort of take that extra step of let's film ourselves and let's, you know, show everybody because we were just larger than life anyway. And, and, and it was easy for them to just sort of, sort of show up and get a production going, you know, and I think that the interest in the business of vintage mixed with, you know, this character of Slobby Robbie was, a, was, a, was just like lightning in a bottle. So it was really easy to, to come up with, you know, content out of it because this is what we do on a daily basis. You know, um, it wasn't like we were small time pickers or whatever. We had the store. We were here every day. We were talking the talk. I was already talking about the goods. I already had, you know, people bringing me crazy stuff. I already mm -hmm. sold crazy expensive stuff. So for us, it wasn't about like building a brand and then, you know, somebody recognizing that we were ready for the big time as much as just we were being ourselves and doing what was really authentic to us. Totally, man. And, yep. and, and I think that um, some of these professionals in the world of entertainment were able to, uh, you know, realized that realized that this was interesting for the whole world and then it, it wasn't just interesting to us for you know it wasn't obscure yeah. so um yep. the the fact that we had the skills to take something that used to be obscure and underground mainstream was probably our biggest asset at that point and uh to tell to answer the last part of your question it, it was crazy it was very stressful to like my my brand and my story had just started getting popular and just getting a lot of attention so to be filming you know for nine months and not be able to really, <laughs> really talk too much of you know yeah, yeah, yeah. About how we were filming a show for complex and you know this and that and that's of course before netflix bought it but we were we i, I was so in the moment that I wasn't really able to document it or, you know, it, it was a lot to run a store and be on a TV. I bet show, it right? was, man. I bet it was. It's stressful too, I imagine. I be the boss and make sure that all the staff were here. And this point in time, I didn't have a huge team and I didn't have the store running itself. So I was yep. still working shifts. Yeah. You know, we had to, when we had to shoot the show, I was still out there like greeting everyone and running the cash. <laughs> Dude, that's it's look, I think there's, there's something major that our listeners need to take back from this Robbie, which is like, Dude, you guys were were already hustling it. You were grinding it in, ter in terms of like part of success. I hate to break it. It is showing up every damn day. And then, or another way for our sports fans out there, you get up to bat again and again and again and again. And sometimes you're, you're grounded out. Sometimes you're ripping home runs. Bottom line is you're showing up game after game after game and you're getting up to damn at bat. And the reality is like what people want to parse out success or steps to success or how to find that success. Like you got to start number one, you got to start. I don't care what your craft or what your business or what your trade is. You've got to start. But the other thing too, man, is like part of honing any craft or part of honing any skill. It's that constant getting up to bat. That's part of the craft. It's part of why in Robbie's case, you become yeah you know, incredible at finding this, this amazing stuff that people want and then educating them about it, informing them about it. And then later, like later in your career, later in the business's life, you get this, this bigger stage or you get this bigger attention where you can showcase the things you'd already been doing all along. You'd already mastered some of the stuff. You already became yeah. you know, savant in your, in your space, man. And this is something that, this is why it's, it's not cliche. I know it's cliche, but like, this is why so many people say there, you got to just get started and then you got to remain focused and then you got to do it a thousand times before you expect anything to happen that's that's the, the bottom line when right. it comes to like figuring out a, a success robbie i want to jump into the fourth and final pillar of feedback brother because i'm excited about this one how did you and jr and the team like what happened early on how did you guys get customer feedback and how did you know 
what to go find more of to sell. How I, I really want to hear your ideas for how you guys right. are good at listening and figuring out how to actually go out, find stuff, put it back up in the market and, 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 and rinse, wash and repeat. Wow. Yeah. That was the hardest part um, for me uh, because I had a, you know, I had a sense in my head that we wanted to do a lot of things and that if we were diverse, that that was going to be more money for us. Uh, so we had streetwear like Supreme and, you know, whatever, um, Palace and all these sort of modern brands that weren't vintage. We would also carry some streetwear because I just realized there was money in it. <laughs> sneakers, right? sneakers were became part of the store and we started realizing that. But guess what? That stuff was very, very taxing and it made it so that. And, you know, you can't take do a huge sneaker buy and walk around and talk to people about vintage and be, you know, be charming and all this. So it was very overwhelming to try to do so much. So when I realized, no, we do we we do 80s and 90s vintage. We do what we set out to do. We you know, I don't need to worry about streetwear and retro and stuff that's been made recently. And when we just focused on vintage, that really helped me hone in on what the customer really wants. And, you know, I was almost trying to put, have my feet in too many areas of fashion. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yep. To be like, let's just focus on vintage. And then we see within the vintage genre what sells the most, you know. So we started seeing, you know, hats, pins, you know, things that are easy to just pick up and, and, and go, you know. And then this is before the T-shirt market went crazy, you know. So I think that honing in on what uh, we were good at and what we really did at our core, just like an artist or, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, when I was at my best as an artist is when my professors are like, okay, look, you do, you like Gucci, you wear Gucci, you like Mr. T, like why, you know, everybody associates those two things with you. Why aren't you doing like a big painting with Mr. T's head on a Gucci print, you know? So yeah. this is what feed for. And so the world was sort of telling me, okay, and even on the show, we were selling streetwear and sneakers still, but I, I'll be rid, I'll be honest. We weren't doing, you know, we weren't, you know, setting the world on fire business wise back then. It just looked like it on the show, of course, yep. TV, yep. but after the show, um, and I would say even before it went to Netflix and we really blew up, I started realizing that focusing just on vintage and paying attention to what's popular or not necessarily popular, but just say what's, what's the most, you know, the financially successful stuff to have in there. Again, mm -hmm. we're not selling a lot of jackets. We're in Arizona. We realize we're selling a lot of hats because it's a college town and we're in Arizona. So you start carrying and you start specializing in certain things. Yep. Uh, and you make sure you have that kind of stuff. A lot of it, Gucci sweatshirts, you know, all of a sudden that was my thing to always be wearing a Gucci sweatshirt with the big logo. And everyone was constantly coming and asking for them. And instead of saying, Oh, they're really hard to find. I just started really farming them. And I don't mean, and I mean, organically out in the world of vintage, not making them myself, but like farming it and really making those connections with the kind of people. Oh, I know he likes these. And I, you know, um, and, and then again, I was able to drive up the market on Gucci sweatshirts. I'm probably, I don't think anybody would argue that I'm probably single-handedly responsible for driving up the market on bootleg vintage Gucci. Yeah. Yep. From the 90s. So um, that was, I would say another part of it is, is sort of recognizing where you can dictate the market on certain things. Um, and so I was like, things I don't like, wasn't setting the world on fire with jeans. I don't know that much about jackets, but all of a sudden I'm the bootleg Gucci guy. Yeah. We have, entire, we have an entire designer section now. It used to just be mixed in with all the t-shirts and now it's its own section. So um, I think that paying attention to what people liked, paying attention to what people liked about me and paying attention to what people came in asking for, you know, if, if people were coming in asking about homies, you know, homies, the little, yeah. the little you know, yeah. So I never had homies, but I started seeing bags of homies and I'm like, yeah, I'll get the homies. And then all of a sudden, <laughs> I, I, stuff that I would have never maybe, you know, thought of just because I didn't collect homies. It was a little bit, I was a little older, you know, than, than homies, but you're starting to realize something that is that important to people that just because, just because it was off my radar doesn't mean we shouldn't be offering. Spot on, Pokemon, man. Spot on. I'm too old for Pokemon, but I sell the shit out of these Pokemon toys, you know? Yep. Dude, it, so I love it. I think Robbie, number one, I just think it's like just another prime example of how many different ways there is to listen to your customers, but not just listen to it, right? Not just collect that feedback, not just listen, go take some action on it, right? Take some action on it. Like learn something from what they're trying to tell you to grow your business, grow your brand, grow your, grow your name, whatever the hell you're trying to grow. 
and listen to them and then go out and, and act on it. So I think that that's awesome. Robbie, this has been an absolute pleasure, brother. I'm so pumped that you were able to come out on the show, share your story. Before you wrap up with us, please let the CX Nation know, where can they find out more about you, sir? And where can they find out more about Generation Cool and your awesome business you guys are building? Uh, Generation Cool on Instagram, straight up. Sloppy Robbie on Instagram. Um, we uh, we have a Thursday Night Lives that we do where we sell and auction stuff and talk a lot. Um, and we'll be doing a lot more of it. I have a brand new studio here and back in the office. And, um, you know, you can watch a lot of our stuff on YouTube that used to be on Netflix and on Complex. And uh, I should have some pretty serious stuff coming out on some other, you know, uh, cable mainstream cable network <laughs> nice man all i can really say is that it'll be even easier to watch the netflix so awesome. uh that's a thing and um you know we'll be probably getting jumping into some brand new arenas here uh i think the tides are changing a lot you know in the social media and digital world so you know we're, we're we'll be heavy in the nft and meta space uh within the next six months as well and i'm actually already you know have a big nft package coming out with hollywood punks um you know so keep an eye out for that kind of stuff in the, in the near future and uh you know we we're still here in tucson arizona too and i had our at our original brick and mortar and uh we um we we're we're expanding our platform as we speak. So I would just keep an eye on our Instagram so that you can see the kind of stuff we're doing with the TV studio and some of the mainstream TV stuff that's coming up. I love it, brother. Well, look, keep, keep it up. We love your work. We love the things that you're doing. Incredible, incredible, totally different way of thinking about customer experience, right? Right, man. So thank you so much for joining the CX Chronicles podcast. Yeah. I look forward to meeting you the next time I'm out West too, brother. We're going to hang out. We're going to, we're going to spend some time together. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Hall, thank you so much for joining the CXC podcast. Thank you, sir.